And we're back on your Thanksgiving week. George Nori with you, L.A. Marzulli with us. L.A., would you say most of the artifacts that you've been talking about have been hidden? Well, some of them are absolutely in plain sight. I mean, obviously, the, the Vatican obelisk is, is sitting in. That's that. right there, yeah. Yeah, but that's what that's what amazes me is some of it is just millions of people go by it every single year and have no idea really what they're looking at, and they don't know the history of this thing, as we talked about in the first hour. Uh, the Nephilim lands, uh, according to Chief Joseph, this is what these 9, 10, 12-foot giants, this is what they used, uh, the red-haired giants that we hear from uh, Sarah Winnemucca. Uh, the thing weighs 28 pounds, and, you know, again, our research with the Nephilim lands, we discovered that Ishbi Banab, who was one of the giants mentioned, in the biblical prophetic text, his spearhead, when you calculate the shekels and you move it into pounds, it's basically 28 pounds. My God. So, you know, am I positive that this is was used by the giants? Well, I picked the thing up, and it's three feet in length, and it's 28 pounds, and it was a lance. How far could uh, you throw it? How could, a normal human being your size, how far could you throw that? Not, not far at all. Not far at all. I mean, it was extremely unwieldy. Uh, now, remember, we didn't have it. It wasn't on a half. It wasn't a, It wasn't mounted. But j- just the weight of that thing, I mean, it's 30 pounds, 28 pounds. It, it's a lot of weight. And it's, it's, it's three feet long. And it's ancient. I mean, whoever, whoever made this, it was cold pounded. I mean, it, in the film, Christian really does a wonderful job of, like, sort of demystifying it. But also with the isotopic ratios and, and what they what they show where it's from is extremely telling. And just like like many of these artifacts that we see, um, some of them are hidden in plain sight. Others are you know kind of hustled away, like the 39 day stone that we have in uh, America Stonehenge. So there it is, and, it, and it's got it's got numerals on it. It was it was found, and that site is incredibly enigmatic. It's right here. In, in America, in New Hampshire, America's Stonehenge. It was also called Mystery Hill. Uh, we might be going back in there to film because, again, we've discovered some things which are very, very enigmatic about that site. But, but here's here's the deal: the 39 Day Stone points to um, to the, the Feast of Beltane, which is 39 days after the equinox, and you come to May 1st. You come to May 1st. Native Americans knew nothing about Baltane, the celebration of Baal. Interesting. Nothing about it. And we've discovered not only there at America Stonehenge, but we've discovered another site in the Americas, which, get this, on May 1st, and we filmed it on May 1st and November 1st. So you've got this, this, the, the spring equinox and the fall equinox. You've got them sitting right there, the sun comes right over, at, at, at one at the spring equinox, it comes right over the um, uh, the gate, right over the gate, bam, how is that possible? And that's, of course, is, is the celebration of Beltane. So this, there it is, it's hidden, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people go to these sites every year, they have no idea what they're looking at. They're, they read the placards and the signs that tell us that Native Americans did this or that. But they didn't. And here's something incredibly mysterious about America's Stonehenge. When, when you sit there at, at the center of their henge, the center of their site, and you look to where the 39-day stone, the bow stone is, that's the only standing stone. Get this, George. It's the only standing stone on the site which has been toppled. It's on the ground. Every other standing stone, and there's probably 20 of them, they're still erect. They're there, but the but the bow stone, the one that points to the to the um, uh, basically Baltane, okay, May first, is is toppled, hmm. and that's what that's what got me thinking. That's what really got me thinking. So we we might be going back there um, at some point and conducting an archaeo- archaeological dig and just seeing what lies beneath it. Yeah, I know you've thought about this quite a bit. And it may be in a future film. But in your opinion, what the heck do you think is going on? 
I think there's a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. I think it points to uh, supernatural intervention. We, we may differ on what we call that. Some people want to say it's ET that's doing it. Myself, these are extra dimensional, interdimensional entities. Um, they're not from another planet, they're from another dimension. So we can argue that till the cows come home, but we do agree that something's going on. Somebody's, something, somebody, some entity is coming here with technology that we don't have today, and that can manipulate space, time, matter, and energy. That their knowledge of advanced uh, uh, geometry, spherical trigonometry, and we show this in an upcoming film, spherical trigonometry. So we're looking at something that's whoever 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 constructs some of these sites, whoever manipulates these the, the granite or, or the stones at Saksiwaman removes these things. They have technology which, which we don't have today. We just don't. Uh, we've got cranes and diamond saws and all this other stuff. You know, show me what, uh, show me how to build a 20 foot wall. And when, when we're down there once again at Oye Tintambo with, with Andre Agassi and we're looking at some of these, some of these cuts in the stone, it's like the machine is, is somebody's almost like they're practicing with the machine. It, it's bizarre. It's like it goes in, it cuts, and everything is, is perfectly symmetrical. So how is it done? So there's this hidden history. And it's not only in Peru. It's in the Americas. It's over in Europe. It, it's a global phenomenon. And that's why we're on the trail. Do you accept the principles of the Bible, L.A.? Some people don't. Completely. Yeah, completely. I think that the biblical prophetic, I was just on a show uh, this morning, you know, and being pummeled <laughs> by people sort of from the other side of the aisle who were talking about, you know, psychic this and spirit guides. And, and I've lived that too. I mean, I was immersed in the new age. I, my third eye was open. I lived in an ashram for three years. Um, I, I was with a guru. Uh, I had spirit guides, as I mentioned. So I, I've been on the other side of the aisle. And then at the ripe age of 30 years old, is when everything began to change. And that's when I uh, gave my life to Jesus. And it was unlike, any, I didn't expect, I had no idea what to expect, actually. And what happened to me was very similar to a fall on the road of Damascus. It was very intense, very severe. And I was in sort of like a spiritual boot camp for three years. Uh, I had two mentors who, who mentored me. Both men were, one was old enough to be my father, the other one was, was old enough, too. He's 20 years older than me, Wayne Kendall. Uh, and uh, these men sort of groomed me, mentored me, taught me what to look for, and, and helped me through a very intense three years, very intense period of my life. So that, that, that's my foundation. Um, that's 43 years ago, George. I'll be 73 in December. So that's, that's, that's 43 years ago. And the experience has only gotten more intense. It hasn't. It hasn't lessened. It hasn't waned or, or gone away or changed. And, and it's just gotten even more intense and to the point where what was written will come to pass. What was foretold is unfolding. I'm talking about the prophetic implications of the biblical narrative. They're unfolding right in front of us today. It's all around us if we have eyes to see. Let's go to the phones. Let's start with first-time caller Melissa in the state of Virginia. Hello, Melissa. Oh, about you. Can you hear me? No, I can't. Let's get you on your phone a little better. Um, there, okay. you, there you go. Okay. Hi, L.A. I'm so glad to get to talk to you. Um, I watch you all the time. <laughs> um, Hi, Melissa. I first, I first found you on Prophecy Watch, and then um, since the church is so clueless about most of the things you talk about, I was so glad that somebody was doing this. I know that we... We lost Rob Skiba, so that just leaves you. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to well, do, two things I want, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Two things I wanted to, to talk to you about. Um, you know, I believe that we're going to find uh, more and more things of what you're talking about, even in America. I know that um, I was just watching something like yesterday even, and I was not aware of it. Uh, I, it's, I think it's called the Bat Cave Stone or the Bat Something yes. Stone. And it's bat, like, bat, a, it's two hours creek. from me over here in Knoxville. And, yeah, you know, creek. that was, 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, the Bat Creek Stone, that's what it's called. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's just up the road here for me. And I I believe that they had translated that to say for the Judeans or for Judah. And and they were saying that was evidence that, you know, Jews had even been here um, in America, maybe came over on the boat or something with, with some people. But um, I think we all know what's going on with, with what you're talking about. And um, the people that are not in our camp do not want the rest of the world to know that the Bible is true, that these fallen angels were here. So every bit of it, you know, has either been hidden, covered up, and what can be carried off to, the, the stone, you know, certain places has been carried off there. <laughs> and then, you know, um, the Jesuit theater we call media just lies to the people. Your thoughts, L.A.? Well, the Back Creek Stone um, and, and some of these other artifacts that were found, they're very controversial. Uh, there were a lot of hoaxes done in the 19th century. Uh, there was this push and pull between one camp, which was saying that um, that some of the mounds and the artifacts that were here in the Americas, they seem to predate the, the Native American culture. Um, and we have on record Native Americans stating on the record that, no, we didn't build the octagon mound or the circle mound or the serpent mound. We didn't do any of this. It was here when we got here. And some of these ancient sites were then used as secondary burials for Native Americans, or they would repurpose them just like the Egyptians did with some of the obelisks and the sites found in Egypt and other places uh, throughout the globe, just like the Inca repurposed Sacsayhuaman. So this is, this is something which, which happens all on a, on a global level. But the bottom line is there was this, this sort of war between two factions, and the faction that won out which is now the prevailing paradigm, which is absolutely sacrosanct. In fact, if you want to become an archaeologist, in many of the textbooks, the first thing you learn about is that there were no giants in America. Well, why, go, why are you telling me this? Uh, and, and I've gone toe-to-toe with some of these people. The Smithsonian's own records from the 1900s talk about the, um, the exhumation of of seven, eight, nine footers, in some places even taller than that, 10, 11, 12 feet. So we know that they did exist. But what happened was, is Cyrus Thomas said, no, 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 no. This is what happened. No one came over here before. This is all Native American. They just forgot that they had done all this. And that's the prevailing paradigm, which is an incredible insult to First Nation oral tradition. So my argument has been this. If, if Native Americans built these sites, surely they would have some knowledge of it in their oral tradition. You would hear it, but it's not there. And we've got several uh, First Nation people, Chief Joseph Riverwind for one, uh, Doris, who is with us also. She's uh, uh, Native American First Nation people. And um, b- all, both of them say, no, no, this is, we had nothing to do with this. this. This was done before we got here. And the vestiges of it uh, remain. We don't know what happens to the people. Uh, there were there were some articles that I was reading very recently, um, just on my own show, George, and talking about different different artifacts, different places, different ruins that were found. The Native Americans always say the same thing. There was a race of very tall white giants that were here, and somehow they disappeared. And this is. This is the nexus of something that I'm researching, because, like I said earlier, we hear this, it's on a global level, that something something happens, and just like that, they're gone. They're just gone. Poof. Like they just here. East of the Rockies, Brian's with us in the state of Indiana. Hi, Brian. Hey, George, good morning. How are you? Okay, my friend. Thanks. Hey, good. Hey, Ali, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for calling in. Roger that. Hey, listen, George, the, the Leonid meteor shower this past weekend didn't disappoint here in south central Indiana. I got up early Saturday morning and seen 16 meteor showers. Oh, that's gorgeous. Be- between 4.30 and 6 a.m., and then I got my sister-in-law up Sunday morning. We were out there for about an hour, and we seen six more. That's worth it. But Yes, sir. Hey, L.A., I got a question about the, the 
ancient Viking sword uh, from way back when. Now, when archaeology found these swords, uh, they were amazed that they, they dated back so early, like 7800 A.D. to 1000 A.D., but they were really amazed by the purity of the swords. Now, the swords were so pure that that they, the iron ore had to be heated up to almost like 3,000 degrees. Now, they got these from the, they say, the Frankish Empire until they embar- put an embargo on it because the Vikings were just wreaking havoc, as we all know. But I'm just curious if you've ever looked into into these ancient swords that, that, that the Vikings had and the purity of the metal from, you know, so pure to way back then. And I'll just, I'll take my answer off the air. Well, actually, to be honest with you, I've never looked into that, um, those swords that you're talking about. I know of them, but I've never done any research there. Um, <laughs> there's so much to look at. There's so many places to go, and there's just not enough years. There's not enough time in a person's lifetime to hmm. do it all. So we, we sort of pick and choose. Um, that's something that I kind of know about, but I've never, never done a deep dive there, never done any research there. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Ellie, you talked about that there could be a part two of Out of Place Artifacts, the film. How many other artifacts did you find that you didn't put into this first one? Well, there's there's a few. It's not like we've got, you know, stacks and stacks of these things. But there there are a few that that we've looked at. Um, for instance, you know, we were just talking about the Backbreed Stone. That We could do a deep dive there. We could do the Nork Holy Stones uh, in, in Nork, uh, Ohio. Uh, which which I've been to both sites. I've seen a replica of the Back Creek Stone, and I've been in the museum with the Norcoli Stones. I'm still weighing in on the whole on what's called the Norcoli Stone. I, I lean towards forgery, although we've had people on both sides of the aisle. Some people believe that they're that they're the real deal. Others believe um, that they're hoaxes. So you know we don't know. Those are just two examples. The Back Creek Stone is certainly another one where we, we look at that um, and, and wonder. The skeleton that was found uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, um, in one of the, uh, the, the what, what's the name of the mound? Oh, it's in West Virginia. But I'll think of it in a second. But the skeleton was found in this, in this chamber. So when they went into the chamber, they realized that, get this, that the dirt was compacted somehow with such a degree of compaction that they didn't need to shore up the walls. Almost like a pile driver buried everything. Stay with us, L.A. We're going to take a short break and come back and take final calls with you. And welcome back. George Nori along with L.A. Marzulli. His website is lamarzulli.net, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. Back to the phones we go. Let's go to Amy in Buffalo, New York. Hello, Amy. Welcome to the program. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. How are you? Sure. Great. Good. I, I kind of have a question for him because uh, uh, the spring equinox uh, well, for 2024 is actually going to be March 19th, and uh, it's going to be at um, 11.06 p.m., and that's the Eastern Standard Time. You're but, good. Uh, last you... year, of course, it was uh, like the 20th or 21st. I know it changes from year to year, but he stated a date that was totally off, so I'm kind of confused about that. And also, he's talking about belting. Belting is also called May Day which was an ancient European festival for, like, the first day of spring. Technically, it falls between the middle part of the summer solstice and the spring equinox. So, L.A., what do you think of those? Well, I, that's, <laughs> I totally get it. What we're saying is the 39-day stone, and we understand that things move. Um, the equinoxes change. The solstice can change a day or two every year. I understand all that. We're saying that these, this particular site, uh, America Stonehenge, is about 4,000 years old. So we have to go back, and there's ways to do that, obviously. But the 39-day stone is from, the, <clears throat> it's from working backwards from May 1st, going back to where the, um, where the spring equinox would take place. And that's what the whole purpose of a 39-day stone is, and it points to Beltane, which um, is a Celtic uh, holiday, Celtic feast day, which, if it's true, 
and that's that's where there's also another site which I won't mention where the gateway opens up directly on May 1st. The sun is right there on May 1st. So something's going on with this. And we know that Native Americans did not celebrate Beltane. And that's why that's incredible. That gets back into um, Eastern Europe. It gets back into the Levant area where the celebration of Bal. It also, it also gets out of place artifact. We, we talk about this in the film. The, the bow stone, which was found at America Stonehenge, written in Iberian Punic, which states to bow the Canaanites in dedication. What the heck is that doing there? That's like an unbelievable out of place artifact. And that was found at America Stonehenge also. LA, of all the elements that you put into out of place artifacts, is there one that just really shocked you the most? Yeah, it was it was the bow stone. Interesting, you should just say that because that's <clears throat> when I'm in the museum and Kelsey Stone, who's the grandson uh, of Robert Stone. So Robert Stone bought the site decades ago. Kelsey's third generation. So Kelsey's taking me through a tour of the museum, showing me the 39 day stone. And I'm I don't understand what that is yet because they hadn't explained it to me. And I, I get to this this one display case and I go, well, what's here? This is all on film, by the way. And Kelsey goes. Well, these are the stones with writing that we found at the site. Oh, really? What's this one say? And he goes, well, that's that's the dedication stone, and it says to bow the Canaanites in dedication. You hear this long pause, and I go, what? I can't even believe what I'm hearing. I go, what did you just say? And he, he kind of laughs nervously, and he goes, to bow of the Canaanites in dedication. It's like it's – You've got to be. What is this doing in New Hampshire? It was written in Iberian Punic. It was. It sat there for, for eleven years in the museum. No one could decipher it. Enter uh, Dr. Barry Fell from Harvard University, who looked at it and said, "This looks like Iberian Punic. I think I can translate it." He translated it. None of these guys have a Nephilim dog in the hunt, as it were. To bow the Canaanites. This is Nephilim Central. This is this is the whole deal right here. The Nephilim were there. And this site, that stone was buried in what they call the Chamber of Ruins, about two feet, 18 inches to two feet below the surface. Why was it buried? Why is the chamber collapsed? These are questions that I'm probing into because it's, it, this, there might be an answer here because it has to do with other sites as well. So, you know, the bottom line is, that stone shouldn't be here. And when you go online and you look up uh, Barry Fell and the Bow Stone, they disparage him. Well, okay, that's, you know, typical ad hominem attacks. Why don't we look at the translation and tell us where we're going wrong? Tell, Barry Fell died years ago, so he can't defend himself. But instead of doing the ad hominem attacks against Mr. Fell, Professor Fell, teaching at Harvard, and it wasn't, that wasn't his first discipline, I get it. But let's look at his work and prove him wrong. If it is Iberian Punic, then you translate it. Find someone who can translate it and show us where he's going wrong. He has no Nephilim dog in the hunt. I do. So for me, that translation was an absolute mind blower. And that's in the film. The bust that looks like the Shroud of Turin is amazing, too. Mm hmm. It really is. I agree. It's and good. we saw that. But I didn't, I didn't equate it with the Shroud of Turin until just recently when I showed it, um, when someone watched the film and then wrote me and said, L.A., do you think? And then he went to the whole shroud. Uh -huh. so that's something I have to chase down. I have to send, send that picture that we took of, of the bus and send it to a synthetologist and get his take on it. Let's go to Jim in Arizona. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jim, go ahead. Hey, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I wanted to talk about Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Okay. Right there in sure. 2012. And uh, I started to look around, and in the sandstones, I could see where there were four figures, and these weren't like, like these were just rough, 20 foot tall, and it looked like four figures of women carrying baskets. And they were standing up out of the sandstone, out of the sand itself. And then about a quarter mile away from that, I came across what looked like a sea turtle coming out 
of the sand, like if it was breaching the water. And I think that whole area is loaded with things up there that I don't think people have really paid attention to. Jim, thanks, thanks for the call. I have been to Chaco Canyon. I need to go back there again. Chaco is one of the most enigmatic places in the Americas. The site, once again, here we go, George, the site was abandoned. Why do I hear that wherever I go? Why do you think that happened? Why did they abandon these places? Well, I have a theory. I, I don't I don't want to talk about the theory yet. Oh, come on. Come on, L.A. No, I can't. I, I, it, it's just a theory. We're looking at something takes place in all these sites where they're deliberately shut down. They are deliberately shut down. And that's that's where I'm going with this. Chaco Canyon is just one example. Just one example. There was cannibalism that was found there. There's a knowledge of an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. The Sun Dagger, which you can't go see anymore, but it's up there. Someone once again has gone through great lens to talk about <clears throat> the 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Native Americans didn't know about the 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Modern day archaeologists will insist, oh, they did because these sites are based on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. That's a straw man argument. You don't know who built this. A Chaco Canyon rises up from nowhere. There's no pre-existing culture with this type of architecture. It's just there. It's just like, and what's similar about this, and having been down in Peru at Corral, which is the oldest city in the Americas, there's a place where you, they won't even let you get near it to photograph. It looks almost exactly like the, like the, the, the sunken kivas at Chaco, almost exactly like it. And, and because I've been to both sites, I went when I went to when I, I went to Chaco first, and then I went to Corral second in Peru, <clears throat> and I went there and I could see it. I just went, this looks this looks like Chaco Canyon. It also looks like Teotihuacan. It's almost not exactly like Teotihuacan, but there are so many similarities, and yet and yet Corral is thousands of years before Teotihuacan in Mexico. And guess what? Just like Chaco Canyon. Corral is abandoned. Teotihuacan is abandoned. We, I hear this over and over and over again. Well, the sites were abandoned, and these people just assimilated into the indigenous population due to climate change. I'm not buying that for a second. <laughs> yeah, I'm not buying that for a second. Something else is going on here. Let's go to Joe in Monterey, California. Hey, Joseph, go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh L.A., glad you're back. Um, Thank you. I was wondering, uh, do you know anything about giant trees? Uh, they're fossilized giant trees, uh, petrified wood. Um, maybe they were in the time of giants? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the fossilized trees that we're looking at um, are certainly pre-flood. Um, and, and the fossils... Fossils could be laid down very, very quickly. People have, have looked into that. Fossils can happen very, very quickly. Um, so, look, we, we live on this little blue ball, and it is absolutely mysterious in so many ways. Nobody really knows how all this started, where we are in the universe, what the universe is. I remember when George asked the, the audience when we were up at the that, that conference the last time I actually saw you right before COVID, George, and you say to the audience, how many people believe in extraterrestrial life? And every hand in the place goes up. And then you say, how many people don't believe in life on other planets? And I was the only hand that went up. And you looked at me like I had two hands. <laughs> and, and, and you said, L.A., why do you believe that? Surely with the trillions of galaxies. And my answer to you was this, that what if it's a holographic universe? What if we're in some sort of a some sort of a holodeck on some level? It would explain a whole lot of things. But who made the holograph? Well, that's my point, isn't it? I mean, you know, we either we either believe in evolution or we believe in the God of the Bible. And because of the prophetic line that goes from Genesis to Revelation, and because of having a personal relationship with Jesus himself for forty three years, that's what I'm betting on all day long. 
First time caller, Catherine in Logan, Utah. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Hi. I enjoy your show so much. Thank you. Um, so I I want to ask him some questions and maybe shed, hopefully there might be some light on some of the things he's wondering about. Well, go, so, go, with, go with a question or two before we run out okay. of time. Go ahead. So, um, well, I wondered if, so... Does he was he aware that uh, Adam and his family started here on on this continent where we are? I mean, it might have all been one continent at the time, and so the Nephilims were probably here, and then and Noah built his ark here on this continent. Now, why do and, you why do you say that? Um, well, there. Um, we, you know, there's, um, I, and if he's, there's also a record that it, it's a spiritual record. It's another testament besides the Bible, but it's supposed to go with the Bible. It's prophesied and told of in Ezekiel 37, 15 to 19. So it's the record called the stick of jo Joseph. And it's supposed to be combined with the stick of Judah, which is the Bible. All right, let's check in with L.A. L.A., I have never heard that Noah's Ark originated in the north, uh, our continent, nor Adam and Eve. Have you? No, I, I would respectfully disagree with that. I mean, I think that Noah's Ark might be on Mount Ararat. There's some some people that say it's there. Um, it, it would be great if somebody actually found the stinking thing. It, it's probably buried way deep in a glacier. But you know, it's I don't I I think that Noah's Ark is is over there, not here. That's my take. I think it is too. And Adam and Eve, I think uh, this all started uh, in the modern day Iraq. Yeah, I, I would I would concur. It's amazing. L.A. We've got about a minute and a half left. What's next for you? Well, we're working on these uh, these UFO films, um, number seven and number eight, Roswell Part One, Roswell Part Two. I'd love to come back in the show at some point. And I'll You're talk to always you. invited. You know that. Thank you, sir. But um, we went out to the debris field, uh, George. We went out to the debris field. Chuck Sikowski, Frank Kimbler, uh, Gil Zimmerman, my business partner, and Jim Peterson. And we had two metal detectors. And Frank found two pieces of the wreckage. Uh, number seven is basically Roswell revisited. And the whole purpose of the film is to exonerate Jesse Marcel Sr., to show that he was a patsy, that it was a setup, that it was not a weather balloon, that Marcel mistook, you know, for a UFO. That's absolute nonsense. And um, moreover, we actually spent hours out in the debris field. We found two pieces of the metal. We've had the metal tested. Chuck Sikowski and Frank Kimbler had the metal tested. And basically, it's from an alloy, an aluminum alloy in the 6000 series, which wasn't invented till 1954, and it's not an exact match. So, you know, we sit down with some really great people um, and interview them uh, in both of these films. And like I said, number seven is to exonerate Jesse Marcel Sr. And number eight is to prove that something crashed there out of, that was not from this world. A long, long time ago. L.A., thanks. Come back again, my friend. The name of the film that we've been talking about tonight, Out of Place Artifacts, that you can go to lamarzuli.net. Up next, The Spirit World. Now you can get show updates and connect with other Coast fans when you join the Coast to Coast AM Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash coast to coast AM and click the like button.